Welcome back to the Cisco NetAcad CCNA3 Enterprise Networking Security and Automation Lecture Series. If you haven't seen my previous lecture series covering CCNA1 and CCNA2, I will leave links in the description for those playlists. I would recommend that you go through the previous CCNA lectures before you move forward with this course. Today, I will cover module number 10, which is Network Management. The primary objective of this lecture is to learn how we can implement protocols to manage the network. We will learn about device discovery with CDP, device discovery with LLDP, how we can implement NTP server, SNMP, syslog, and we will learn about the router and switch file maintenance. And finally, we will cover how we can do the iOS image management. Device discovery with CDP. CDP overview. CDP is a Cisco proprietary layer two protocol that is used to gather information about Cisco devices which share the same data link. CDP is media and protocol independent and runs on all Cisco devices such as routers, switches, and access servers. So one of the key pieces of information you should remember is that the CDP is a Cisco proprietary layer two protocol. So it is not a uh, protocol that is open source or anything, but however, you may find this in some other devices if Cisco has some agreements with others, uh, but however, uh, it is a Cisco proprietary layer two protocol. So the device sends periodic CDP advertisement to connected devices. These advertisements share information about the type of device that is discovered, the name of the devices, and the number and the type of interfaces. So the CDP stands for Cisco Discovery Protocol, and it is a proprietary layer two protocol, and how it works is by sending CDP advertisements to connected devices in a periodic way, so that it can gather the information with respect to uh, you know, what is contained within that device. So for example, it includes the type of device, name of the device, the number, and the type of interfaces in that device. So that's how the CTP advertisements work. Configure and verify CDP. For Cisco devices, CDP is enabled by default. To verify the status of CDP and display information about CDP, enter show CDP command. So the command that we will use to check this is show CDP. To disable CDP on a specific interface, enter no CDP enable in the interface configuration mode. So you go into that interface and for example, interface G00, then within the interface configuration, we're gonna issue no CDP enable and that's gonna disable the CDP. CDP is still enabled on the device. However, no more CDP advertisements will be sent out of that interface. So that will be disabling CDP on that particular interface only. To enable CDP on the specific interface, again, you can enter the CDP enable. So the opposite of this command will re-enable the CDP. To enable CDP globally for all the supported interfaces on the device, enter CDP run, so the command CDP run in the global configuration mode. The CDP can be disabled for all interfaces on the devices with the no CDP run command in the global configuration mode. So if you want to disable CDP in a specific interface, you enter no CDP enable within the interface. If you want to enable it within the interface, we're going to run C, we're going to issue the command CDP enable. But if you want to disable uh, we are the for the entire uh, you know device you run no CDP run and to enable for the entire device we're going to enter CDP run and uh, on the global configuration mode add opposed to the interface configuration mode. So the show CDP interface command can be used to display the interfaces that are CDP enable on that uh, on a particular device. The status or status of each interface is also displays 
uh, when you run the show cdp interface command discover devices by using cdp with cdp enable on the network the show cdp neighbors command can be used to determine the network layout as shown in the output on the bottom of your screen so on here by just running show cdp neighbors it's going to show a you know the information related to any cdp devices connected within that network so the output shows that there is another cisco device which is s1 right here connected to the g001 because we know that right here on the interface on r1 Furthermore, S1 is connected through its F05, uh, you know, interface. So how do we know that? Right here, we have the device ID, which is S1, which is the, the host name of that, uh, you know, switch. And we know it is connected to 001. That is the interface of this local R1 router where we ran the show CDP neighbors. But on here, we have the port ID showing F05. That is the port ID of this Cisco switch. So that's how you can actually view this information. Again, I'm gonna quickly mention this, that I will run live demonstration of these lab activities and examples on separate videos that is separate from this lecture and I will post to my YouTube channel sometimes later. So I'm not gonna repeat that, that comment again. So I'm just gonna go through these slides now so that you have a better understanding of the concepts that we're gonna to cover today. And I, we will cover the actual lab demonstration such as this show CDP neighbors commands on separate videos. So the network administrator uses show CDP neighbors detail to discover the IP address of for that uh, S1 in that example, the switch one. As displays in the output, the IP address for S1 is now uh, we know using that command to be 192.168.1.2. So how do we know that? Because when you run the show CDP neighbors detail command, show CDP neighbors detail, and that's gonna give you the device IDs. So if there's multiple IDs, um, multiple devices, you're gonna have multiple device IDs with the information listed uh, below. And in this case, we have a switch one um, that connected to this router R1 and the IP address of that switch one, that port is the 192.168.1.2. We know this because it is this listed right here. So there's a packet tracer activity called use CDP to map a network. Uh, and if you have uh, access to this packet tracer file, please go ahead and uh, you can do it. Uh, but however, what I'm gonna do is that I will do this um, packet tracer activity on a live lab demonstration on a separate video and I will post to my YouTube channel later sometime so you have a better idea about how to do it. But if you want to know what's in this packet tracer file, here's a description of that. Device discovery with LLDP. LLDP overview. LLDP stands for Link Layer Discovery Protocol and it is a vendor neutral neighbor discovery protocol similar to CDP. Remember, CDP is Cisco proprietary protocol. It works with Cisco devices. LLDP is however, is a vendor neutral universal protocol. LLDP works with network devices such as routers, switches, and wireless LAN access points. This protocol advertises its identity and capabilities to other devices and receives the information from a physically connected layer two device. So LLDP is also utilizing the layer two to discover devices nearby and it is vendor neutral and can work with routers, switches, wireless, LAN access point, etc. So how do you configure uh, LLDP and verify it on a Cisco device. So LLDP may be enabled by default. Uh, to enable LLDP globally on a Cisco network device, you can enter LLDP run command in the global configuration mode. So just like CDP run command, we're gonna issue right now LLDP run command. 
to disable LLDP, uh, you can enter the no LLDP run command in the global configuration mode. So to enable it, LLDP run, to disable it, no LLDP run. LLDP can be configured on specific interfaces. However, LLDP must be configured separately to transmit and receive LLDP packets. So you can configure uh, LLDP on separate interfaces. It is not actually advisable to do that uh, how, because LLDP must be configured separately to transmit and receive LLDP packets on those devices in that situation. To verify LLDP is enabled, you can enter the show LLDP command in privilege executive mode. So on a Cisco device, you can go to privilege executive mode by running the config T or configure terminal command. And then you can run the LLDP, um, you know, show LLDP uh, and that will display the status or status of that LLDP configuration. In here, it shows it is active and the LLDP advertisements are sent every 30 seconds and it has some additional information associated with that. Discover devices using LLDP. So with LLDP enabled, Device neighbors can be discovered by using the show LLDP neighbors command. So just like the CC is a CDP, LLDP can also be used for the same purpose. By this time, you're going to run show LLDP neighbors command. So when you run the show LLDP neighbors command in this Cisco switch, we see that the R1 and R2 are connected to that switch and it has the local interface of that switch that these devices are connected. In this case, the R1 is connected via FA05 and the R2 is connected via FA01. So this is the local port. And on here, we can see the port in which those uh, devices are connecting to this switch. So the switch two is using its FA01 to connect to uh, switch one's FA01 while the R1 is using G001 port on their its end to connect to the switch one's FA05. So the same information, similar table that we had with the uh, CDP uh, neighbors, uh, we see here on the LLDP neighbors because it is a similar protocol. One happened to be proprietary, the other one happened to be open to everybody. So when more details about the neighbors are needed, you can use the show LLDP neighbors detail command, which can provide information such as the neighbor, uh, iOS version, IP address, and device capability. So if you have the Cisco devices on your network, but you're not running CDP, you're running LLDP, you can run the show LLDP neighbors detail on your Cisco device, and that will actually give you the information uh, such as the, the, the neighbor iOS version, IP address, and device uh, capability. So in here, they have run show LLDP neighbors detail on the switch one, and you can see that information being populated, including the Cisco iOS version that is listed right here. So which is pretty neat that the Cisco can also utilize the LLDP to provide some information about its own devices as well. Again, there is a packet tracer activity called use LLDP to map a network. If you do not have access to this particular packet tracer file through your Cisco NetaCAD, I will try to find a copy and post to my sanuju.com website, as well as I will do a live lab demonstration video on this packet tracer file lab, and I'll post it onto my YouTube channel sometimes later. NTP or Network Time Protocol. Time and Calendar Services. So the software clock on a router or switch starts when the system boots. It is the primary source of time for the system. It is important to synchronize the time across all devices on the network because that's how packets also get synchronized. When the time is not synchronized between devices, it will be impossible to determine the order of events and cause of an event. So typically the date and time settings on a router or switch can be set by using one of two methods. 
They include you can manually configure the date and time as shown in the example, or you can configure the uh, the time using the network time protocol, also known as NTP. So on the right, on the bottom of your screen, you see that they have manually set the time here by running clock set, and they are setting the time. Uh, to uh, 2036 with November 15, 2019. And this is a manually set uh, clock in this situation because we have set it that way uh, using that manual configuration. However, you also have the option to actually use the network time protocol. So instead of entering this 8 p.m., uh, 8.36 p.m. Um, time manually, by entering 2036 and the date of November 15, 2019, we can use the network time protocol NTP uh, to configure that as well. So there's two options to set the time of a Cisco or other networking devices. As a network grows, it becomes difficult to ensure all infrastructure devices are operating with synchronized time using manual method. So if you have a lot of devices on your network, or even if you have a small network uh, in a corporate or business environment, it would be very difficult for all the uh, technicians and uh, you know engineers to go around and change those times manually because it's pretty annoying, right? So what can we do? Well, a better solution is to configure that NTP on the network because NTP is a server-based time management system, right? So this protocol allows routers on the network to synchronize their time settings with an NTP server, which provides more consistent time settings. NTP can be set up to synchronize to a, a private master clock, or it can synchronize to a publicly available NTP server on the internet. NTP uses UDP port 123 and is documented in the RFC 1305. So for example, of a public uh, uh, NTP server would be the Google NTP. So some people use that. So you can use the Google NTP to synchronize. That is a publicly available NTP. Uh, the other option, for example, of a public NTP is, I believe, MIT uh, University, MIT.edu has a, uh, a public NTP uh, address that you can use to synchronize with their servers as well. Uh, the, Microsoft has their NTP servers. So if you are using Windows 10 or Windows 11 or Windows servers, they are, I believe, by default set to Microsoft NTP server to uh, for time synchronization but you can manually configure to your own NTP server. So uh, those are publicly available options, but also you can create it a, your private uh, NTP server within your network. Uh, it is important that you also know which port is used by NTP. So the NTP is a UDP based protocol that is using port number 123. So let's look at NTP operation. NTP networks use a hierarchical system of time sources. Each level in this hierarchical system is called a stratum. The stratum level is defined as the number of hop counts from the authoritative source. The synchronized time is distributed across the network by using NTP. Please keep in mind the maximum hop count is 15. The stratum 16, the lower stratum level, indicates that a device is unsynchronized. So if you look at a topology of a NTP uh, network structure, it is hierarchical and it has stratums. So it starts from stratum 0 all the way to stratum 15. And each level in this hierarchical system uh, will be defined as the number of hop counts from the uh, you know uh, from the source. So for example, this is the source, and the source itself have a stratum zero, and then the very first device that's gonna get synchronized on that chain of um, networks, gonna have those devices gonna have stratum one. 
and the next device is going to get uh, synchronized with this same um, straight, uh, straight m zero where the NTP is located, going to have straight m two, and the next one going to have straight m three, and so on and so forth until the hop counts reach the straight m fifteen. At straight m sixteen, the devices become unsynchronized because it's too far away from that the NTP, uh, you know, uh, system. So NTP source the maximum length you know stratums that can handle is 15 stratums so you should know that so after you know, the 16th uh, hop count when reach 16 uh, you know become unsynchronized so this is the basic topology of a ntp operation so in stratum zero these Authoritative time sources are high precision timekeeping devices assumed to be accurate and with little or no delay associated with them. So that's what happening on that hierarchical model. So if you go back to the previous slide, in here, the stratum zero, that's where basically we have those time uh, servers. So these are authoritative time sources that are high precision timekeeping devices assured to be accurate with little or no delay associated within those devices. Stratum 1 are devices that are directly connected to that authoritative time sources and they act as the primary network time standard. So the Stratum 1 devices are the directly connected authoritative time sources uh, that they act like the primary network time standard. So the stratum zero is the authoritative time source and the stratum one is the directly connected authoritative uh, time, uh, you know, uh, directly connected devices to that uh, authoritative time source. And that would act like the primary network sta time standard. Then stratum two and lower, so anything after, come after or no after stratum two uh, serves uh, as uh, you know, the, those are ser servers that are connected to stratum one devices through the uh, network connections, and the stratum two devices, such as the NTP clients, synchronize their time by using NTP packets from stratum one servers. They could also act as servers for stratum three devices as well. So when the stratum two get synchronized from the stratum one devices, it can then you help synchronize the stratum three devices and so on and so forth. The time servers on the same stratum level can be configured to act as a peer with each other time servers on the same stratum level for backup or verification. So to um, to understand that concept, so basically if you have time servers in the same stratum level, you can interconnect them with between them just to create that backup uh, level uh, and verification uh, for that time, uh, time of that uh, synchronization. So for example, if I go back to this diagram, right here, see this in stratum two, they connect, they are showing these two devices are connected to each other as like a backup. So they are in the same stratum level. They are, one is getting time from this and one is getting time from this path, but they are also interconnected across in the same stratum. Same here with the stratum three, we see these two devices are interconnected. So what it's doing is those, those time servers on the same stratum level are acting as peers so that they can work with each other to as backup as well as the verification of time. So even though this device may be getting time from here and this device is time getting here, they can synchronize between them as well. In this case, they are using the same stratum zero, they can synchronize and here they are using two stratum zero devices, but they can synchronize across as well. Configure and verify NTP. So on a Cisco device, before NTP is configured on the network, you can run the show clock command to display the current time on the software clock. So if you run show clock uh, command uh, with, the, uh, with some options associated with that to check that information. So with the detail option with the show clock command, notice that the time source is user configuration. So right here, show clock and the option of detail is added. And when you run that command, you can see the time source is user configuration. That means the time was manually configured with the clock command. So the, the time is manually configured with the clock command that I introduced previously. 
So the NTP server command with the option of IP address associated with that NTP server can be issued in the global configuration mode to configure the NTP server for R1. In this example, the NTP server happened to be located at 192.168.200.225. So we're gonna issue the NTP server 209.165.200.225 command. So that would become the NTP server for this router. So to verify the time source is set to NTP, after you issue this command, you can run the show clock detail command. So right here, show clock detail command. But now, instead of having time source is user configuration, now it will say time source is NTP. So notice that the time source has now changed because we are now using the NTP server located at this IP address. The show NTP associations and show NTP status or status commands are used to verify R1 is synchronized with the NTP server located at 209.165.200.225. So on the bottom of your screen, you see the show NTP associations uh, command is being issued here and the show NTP status command is issued right here and that actually can be used to verify that the NTP server we configured which happened to be 209.165.200.225 is properly set right here. Notice that the R1 is synchronized with a stratum 1 NTP server at 209.165.200.225 right here which is synchronized with a GPS clock. The show NTP status command display that the R1 is now a Stratum 2 device that is synchronized with the NTP server located at that IP address. So you can see that right here, it says Stratum 2 when you run the show IP and NTP status. So the R1 is at Stratum 2, but the server is at Stratum 1 because we know that because in here it shows Stratum 1 here. So the R1 is synchronized with a Stratum 1 NTP server and the R2, uh, so, uh, sorry, and, and the R1 is now a Stratum 2 device. So the serv NTP server is a Stratum 1 device and uh, uh, the router itself is a Stratum 2 device. The clock on S1 is configured to synchronize to R1 with the NTP server command and the configuration is verified with the show NTP association command. So you can see in the switch that we have on the example, we're gonna run the NTP server command with the associated uh, IP address. In this case, we are using the router and then we're gonna issue the show IP, uh, sorry, show NTP associations and show NTP status command to check that those verification. Notice the output from the show INTP associations command verifies that the clock on S1 is now synchronized with the R1 uh, 192.168.1.1 via the NTP. The R1 is a Stratum 2 device, making S1 thus now the Stratum 3 device that can provide NTP service to other devices on the network. So remember, the S1 is connected behind the R1 and the S1 is using R1 as the NTP and the R1 is using a the NTP server on Stratum 0. So the R1 becomes Stratum, uh, you know, uh, uh, become the uh, stratum 2 uh, because remember from our previous slide right here the R1 is stratum 2 the NTP server is stratum 1 but now the switch which is connected to the R1 behind the, all of those become the stratum 3 device because show NTP status now has right here showing a stratum 3 and the, the, the R1 uh, which is being used uh, for NTP by this switch is at stratum 2 showing up here. So the show NTP associations in this switch in this example showing that the R1 is a stratum 2 device and the S1, the device itself is now a stratum 3 device because it's behind the router and it is using the R1 as the NTP server. 
Again, there is a packet tracer file called configure and verify NTP. I will try to get a hold of this packet tracer file and post to my uh, sanuj.com website. And I will also do a live lab demonstration on this packet tracer file sometime later uh, next few weeks. SNMP. Introduction to SNMP. SNMP was developed to allow administrators to manage nodes on an IP network. It enables network administrators to monitor and manage network performance, find and solve network problems, and plan for network growth. SNMP is an application layer protocol that provides a message format for communication between ma managers uh, and agents. The SNMP system consists of three elements. They include the SNMP manager, SNMP agent, which is the managed node, and management information base, also known as MIB. SNMP defines how management information is exchanged between network management applications and management agents. SNMP manager polls the agents and queries the MIB for SNMP agents on UDB port 161. SNMP agents sends any SNMP traps to the SNMP manager on UDP port 162. So you should know for your exams and quizzes and also to understand uh, the concepts behind SNMP, you should know these three parts uh, associated with uh, SNMP and you should know uh, the SNMP is using uh, port 161 um, and port uh, 162 for its operations. You should know that for your exams and quizzes. And one other thing I would also mention is that if you never heard the term SNMP before uh, until now, the SNMP actually stand for Simple Network Management Protocol. I don't know why Cisco haven't mentioned that on this slide, considering that they are introducing this to you for the first time. So the SNMP is stand for Simple Network Management Protocol. And the Simple Network Management Protocol is commonly known as SNMP as an abbreviated term. And it has these three components and those are key elements that you should be aware of. So again, just in case you never heard the term SNMP before, it stands for Simple Network Management Protocol. And it is an internet standard protocol for collecting and organizing information about managed devices on an IP networks for modifying uh, that is those information uh, the, and change those device behavior. So that is the primary purpose of SNMP. So the SNMP stand for the network management protocol and it is an internet standard protocol it is not a cisco proprietary protocol or anything like that it is a global international standard protocol for collecting and organization uh, uh, organizing information about managed devices on an ip network so you sh you should know that and you know that is a very key piece of information that you should know because uh, I don't know why Cisco didn't mention what SNMP stand for and uh, the, the fact that it is a universal uh, you know, system uh, on this slide. The SNMP manager is part of a network management system also known as NMS. The SNMP manager can collect information from an SNMP agent by using the get action and can change configurations on an agent by using the set action. SNMP agents can forward information directly to a network manager by using what we call traps. So the SNMP agent and MIB reside on SNMP client devices. MIB stores data about the device and operational statistics and are meant to be available to authenticated remote users. So the SNMP agent is responsible for providing access to those local MIBs. So if you look at on the right hand side, we, can, we have a network, simple network diagram with SNMP uh, set up. So we have the SNMP manager uh, that could send the set and get uh, requests. Remember, uh, the get is an action that uh, can gather data while the set 
uh, is a uh, you know action where uh, you can change the configuration of devices using SNMP, and then the uh, the SNMP agents uh, can forward information to a manager. So these agents, for example, can send those information by something called traps. So for example, this router will have a trap, this SNMP uh, enable uh, switch will have a trap, and this node will have a trap. And those trap can then send that data to that SNMP manager. So keep that in mind, uh, you know, what is get, what is set, what is trap. So the trap is get, gather, sending data to the SNMP manager. Get is when the SNMP manager uh, try to you know, collect information. And the set is the SNMP manager trying to change the behaviors of these devices using SNMP. So those are key pieces of information that you should remember from here. Uh, next few slides, I, I will, you know, discuss that a little bit in detail uh, as well. So let's look at the SNMP operation. SNMP agents can reside on managed devices, collect and store information about the device and its operation locally in the MIB. So the managed devices are routers, switches, for example, uh, or the node, like a node, uh, you know, bordering device, right? So the SNMP manager then uses the SNMP agent to access information within the MIB, as I described before. There are two primary SNMP manager requests, and they are get and set. Remember, again, I briefly mentioned in the previous slide about that. In addition to the configuration, a set can cause an action to occur, like restarting a router. So you can use the SNMP remote you know, manager request to be sent to a router, for example, to reboot it, you know. So you can restart using uh, those action, uh, you know, messages. So on the bottom of your screen, you have a list of operation those SNMP uh, can do and the description of what it will do. So there is a operation called get-request. What it's gonna do is it will retrieve a value from a specific variable. So you can use the get-request command in this, within the SNMP to retrieve a specific um, data from a router, switch, or a node, for example. Get dash next dash request so the get dash net dash uh, request operation uh, what it's going to do it will retrieve a value from a variable within a table the snmp manager does not need to know the exact variable name in this situation it's just going to uh, retrieve the value so a sequential search is performed to find the needed variable uh, from within a table. So what the get dash next dash request gonna do is it's gonna find the next value in that table that matches that request and then retrieve that information uh, for the SNMP uh, process. And it's gonna do that by running that search sequentially uh, on the system. Get dash bulk dash request. So the get dash bulk dash request retrieves large blocks of data instead of a one single variable. In this case, we are retrieving large blocks of data such as multiple rows in a table that would otherwise require a transmission of many small blocks of data. So instead of using many get next dash request, we are using get dash bulk request. Um, and one thing you should know about uh, this, uh, the, the get dash block request only works with SNMP version two or later. So if you have SNMP uh, previous versions other than SNMP version two or um, above, uh, that would not work. Get dash response operation. So the get dash response replies to a get dash request, get dash next dash request, and set dash request sent by an NMS. So the primary purpose of get dash response is a response to those requests sent by the NMS. Set dash request operation. The set dash request operation stores a value in a specific variable. So it's basically the SNMP can send a set request uh, operation to change a variable within a network device that is set, uh, have configured SNMP. 
So that's what the set request does. So these are pretty much self-explanatory because like, you know, they're, they're English terms. They are pr pretty much, you know, if, if somebody tell you set dash request, you should automatically know it's going to set a value uh, in a specific variable, um, you know, uh, but you just need to know these some specific key items uh, that each of these operations going to do for your exams and quizzes as well as when you are doing your lab exams, you need to know what these variables are and how they are differ from each other. The SNMP agent responds to SNMP manager requests as follows. So get an MIB variable. So what that's going to do is the SNMP agent performs this function in response to a get request dash PDU from the network manager. The agent retrieves the value of the requested MIB variable and responds to the network manager with that value. So the get an MIB variable, what it's going to do is the SNMP agent perform this function in response to a get request dash PDU from the network manager and the agent retrieve the value of the requested MIB variable and respond to the network manager with that variable or that value in the, so that value associated with that variable. Set an MIB variable. So what this is going to do is the SNMP agent perform this function in response to a set request that PDU from the network manager. So set request dash PDU. The SNMP in this situation, what's going to happen is the SNMP agent changes the value of the MIB variable to the value specified by the network manager and an SNMP agent reply to the set request includes the new settings of that device. So in this case, the, the SNMP agent going to you know, uh, respond to that set uh, request PDU by changing the variable and responding with the new variable information. So in here, an example of a situation where this um, device is going to say, I want to check the MIB variable to find out if G000 is up and up. So I want to know if the G00 interface is up. And this um, user may be remotely connected to this R1 within the network. So it is going to have SNMP get request going to here. And then the, 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 you know, the, the router going to respond accordingly. SNMP agent traps. Traps are unsolicited messages alerting the SNMP manager to a condition or event on the network. Trap directed notifications reduce network and agent resources by eliminating the need for some of a SNMP policing, uh, sorry, polling request. So remember that the traps are unsolicited messages. So they are not solicited messages. Nobody's requesting those messages. So the traps are unsolicited messages alerting the SNMP manager to a condition or event on the network. So there are kind of some kind of a condition or and something happened in the network that the, you know, this alert gonna go out. So the trap directed notifications reduce network and agent resources by eliminating the need for some of SNMP polling requests. So that's what the traps doing. Trap is trying to mitigate the, any issues that might, might come about if the, you know, the, these messages are being sent uh, across the network all the time. So instead of we have these traps set up so that the trap directed notification going to reduce that the network burden uh, and resource usage uh, because those traps are going to be polling those uh, requests. Figure illustrate uh, the use uh, on the figure on the bottom of your screen illustrate the use of a SNMP trap to alert the network administrator that the interface G000 uh, has failed and the SNM, uh, sorry, N, uh, the NMS software can send the network administrator a text message uh, or a pop-up window on the NMS software or uh, turn the uh, router icon red in the NMS uh, graphical user interface. So the trap will be, what the trap is doing is trap is collecting all the data. Then as soon as it sees the G000 interface has failed, it's going to say, hey, take a look. The trap has received a message saying G000 has failed. Please take a look at it. You know, it's going to alert the user. 
So instead of sending messages saying, oh, it is up, it is up, it is up, it is up, it's only going to send the message when it is down. So that's what it, traps are doing. So traps are unsolicited messages, alerting the SNMP manager to condition or event of the network. However, the traps directed notifications reduce the network and agent resources by eliminating the need for some of the SNMP polling requests because polling only going to happen at the trap itself and the message only going to go out when there is an alert needed to be sent out to the user. So that's what the SNMP agent traps do. So I mentioned some of the, you know, the fact that some of these features only available in SNMP version two and up, for example, or three and up. Uh, so here are some, uh, you know, the, the exam so the, here are some details on those different versions of SNMP. So we have SNMP version one, uh, which is a legacy standard defined by the RFC 1157. Uh, uses a simple community string based authentication method and should not be used due to security risk. So this is a, the legacy, very first version of the SNMP. It is unsecured because it used a community based authentication method and it's pretty uh, vulnerable to hackers. SNMP version 2C is defined in RFC uh, uh, 1901 to 1908. Those are the RFC standards that define the SNMP version uh, 2C. Uh, and uh, it uses a simple community string-based authentication uh, method, provides for bulk retrieval options, uh, as well as more detailed error messages. So this one, uh, as opposed to version one, allow our, uh, us to get uh, bulk uh, uh, data back, as well as more detailed error messages um, in this system. The SNMP version three, which is defined by the RFCs uh, 3410 to 3415, uh, uses username authentication, uh, provides data protection using H HMAC MD5 hash and HMAC SHA and encryption using DES, 3DES or AES encryption. In modern day, if you are implementing SNMP on any network, including Cisco devices, Microsoft uh, uh, servers, et cetera, et cetera, any device that you will be using, I would recommend that you always use SNMP version three, unless there is a dire need, there is a requirement in your organization that you have to use previous version. So in modern day, in 2022, any implementation of SNMP should be using SNMP version three because it is secure, it is better, and it can handle uh, the same things as SNMP version one and SNMP version, SNMP version uh, 2C. So I would recommend that you always use SNMP version three. So during an exam or a quiz, if your um, instructor or Cisco ask you what is one of the key features of SNMP, SNMP version three, you should be able to tell them that it supports the MD5 and SHA as well as the encryption using DES, 3DES or AES uh, as well. Community strings. So remember SNMP version one and SNMP version two C use community strings uh, that control access to the MIB, right? So the community strings are plain text passwords. So SNMP community strings uh, authenticate access to uh, MIB objects using those plain text passwords. And there are two types of community strings. They are called read only or RO ones. So those are, this is, uh, the type that provides access to the MIB variables, but does not allow these variables to be changed and they are just read only. And because security is minimal in version 2C, many organizations use SNMP version 2C in read only mode. So if you want to use SNMP, you know, uh, version 2C, uh, you can um, just use the read only mode to at least secure it uh, from that point of view. The write, uh, the read write one, which is called RW, read write RW, 
uh, this type provides both read and write access to all objects in MIB. And because it also uses a plain text password, it is pretty unsecure at that moment. So this is at least, even if somebody get hold of those plain text password, they only can do read only, they cannot write. But in this situation, this type of community string will result in the full access, read and write access uh, to all the objects in the MIB. To view or set MIB variables, the user must specify the appropriate community string to for read uh, or write access. So remember that to view or set MIB variables, the user must specify the appropriate community string for read or write access. It is not automatically done just because of you install SNMP version 1 or SNMP version 2C. You have to explicitly define which version need to be used. So it is not, uh, the nothing is by default set up uh, in this configuration. MIB object ID. Remember, MIB is the management information base. So the MIB uh, stand for the management information base and that organizes the variable hierarchy because that, that is the management information base. That's the purpose of the management information base. So formally, the MIB defines each variable as an object ID, also known as OID. So the OID is uniquely identify manage objects. The MIB organizes the OIDs based on the RFC standards to a hierarchical of OIDs, usually shown as a tree. So the MIB, the primary purpose is to organize the variable hierarchy because it is the management information base. That is the primary purpose of it. And it uses the object ID, OID, to uniquely identify so that it can manage those objects, right? So. Uh, how it's going to do that is basically it's going to create a hierarchy of those OIDs. So the MID tree, uh, MIB tree for any given device includes some branches with variables common to many networking devices and some branches with variables specific to that device or vendor. So if you have a Cisco switch or router, it might have a specific variable associated with that MIB tree. So the, in, within that MIB tree. So the RFCs define some common public variables. So as opposed to vendor specific variables, RFCs define some common public variables. So the most devices would implement those MIB variables. Uh, but however, in addition, uh, the network equipment vendors such as Cisco can define their own private branches of the tree to accommodate new variables specific to their devices. So there may be some Cisco proprietary um, firmware or that can support certain features that are not available in other vendors uh, specific devices. So then Cisco can go ahead and uh, um, you know create its own private branches within uh, the, this RFC uh, framework so that uh, you know it, it can still be used within that MIB uh, mechanism. So keep that in mind. So there might be, uh, you know, the, the operations of MIB, that's how, work, that's how it works. The figure on the right hand side shows portions of the MIB structure defined by Cisco. Note how OID can be described in words or numbers to help locate a particular variable in the tree. So on the right hand side, you can have either the number associated with that, like three, or you can use ORG that will still give you uh, that uh, same o uh, you know, uh, same um, information. So that the OID can be described, uh, you know, either using word like DOD or that number itself. The OIDs belongs to Cisco are numbered as follows, IOS, sorry, uh, ISO, sorry, ISO, dot ISO, which is one, dot ORG, which is three, dot DOD, which is six, dot internet, which is one, dot private, which is four, dot enterprises, which is one, and dot Cisco, which is uh, nine. So these are the items, uh, you know, that can be, def that are defined uh, and belongs to Cisco. Like for example, right here, uh, this Cisco, which is nine, uh, and you know it is, it can be either described as nine or it can be described as Cisco. Either or would be 
okay and the oid belongs to that would be nine right so therefore the cisco oid uh, is one dot three dot six dot one dot four dot one dot nine why because this oids belong to a cisco must have that oid string so it is 1.3.6.4.1.9 so if you like if you want to know like it's basically so 1.3.6.1.4.1.9.9 uh, sorry, .9 will get you to cisco so if you want to know the oid for cisco it'll get you 1.3.6.1.4.1.9 that is cisco because we end up in cisco right here I know this is kind of confusing right now. So I'm gonna go through these modules slides that were provided to us by Cisco. Uh, then I will also do additional associated complimentary videos on my YouTube channel associated with SNMP on a separate uh, lecture series. So because I'm gonna do a lecture series on uh, servers, client server management and server management on those courses that I'm gonna do on my YouTube channel. I will also go into depth of how these MIB object IDs works and how you can identify them and a little bit more in a comprehensive way. But for now, we will just keep going on this lectures for now. Uh, then, you know, we will get back to this uh, later sometimes as well. SNMP polling scenario. SNMP can be used to observe CPU utilization over a period of time by polling devices. CPU statistics can then be compiled on the NMS and graphed. So you can actually graph all the data associated with a CPU, not only just CPU utilization, but also temperature and a whole bunch of other data as well. Um, but in here we are discussing the CPU utilization over a period of time. And what you can do is the statistics associated with that can be compiled on the NMS, then those statistics can be graphed. So this creates a baseline for network administrators. So if you are trying to monitor your network, you can use these as baselines. So that their data or data is retrieved via the SNM P get utility. So we're going to use the SNMP get utility uh, issued on the NMS. Using the SNMP get utility, which is issued on the NMS, you can manually retrieve real time data or have NMS run a report. This report would give you a period of time that you could use data to get the average. So what's going to happen is you can use these reports and you can do it over, the, over a period of time and then you can use that data within that period of time to get averages for the CPU utilization. Hence you're going to create a baseline. So right here on the bottom of the screen you have the SNMP get uh, you know issued in here in this terminal and it'll, you have to issue the version number, community, we are using the community string, and we have the IP uh, address associated with that, and we have the OID number, and it's gonna return some CPU values associated with that. Again, uh, if you're using a uh, SNMP software with a graphical user interface, you may not even need to use this terminal methodology where you get these integer values, but you'll get a nice graph associated with that. And again, I, on a separate uh, lecture video, I will show you how you can create an SNMP uh, configuration on a, a Windows server and some Windows machine uh, later sometime. But this will give you a basic background associated with that lab that I'm gonna do later. So keep that in mind. SNMP object navigator. The SNMP get utility gives some insight into basic mechanics of how SNMP works. However, working with long MIB variable names like 1.3.6.1.4.1.9.2.1.58.0 can be problematic for average user because there are more likely a human gonna make a mistake with these numbers when they're trying to enter those requests to the system. The more commonly, the network operators uh, staff uh, 
you know, network operation staff uses a network management product with an easy to use GUI, which makes the entire MIB data variable naming transparent to the user. So instead of every time, uh, you know, you are entering these values on a terminal like this terminal they are doing right here, right, right here, you can actually use a GUI, like I mentioned, like even Windows servers comes with built in in SNMP, uh, uh, you know, modules where you, you have a nice graphical user interface on the Windows server, you can run uh, these commands. So in here, they are showing the Cisco uh, uh, version of that. So we, we, that makes the entire NIB variable naming transparent to that user. So the Cisco SNMP navigator uh, that you, you can check out on the Cisco web, uh, in this case, where they are checking the Cisco website, allows a network administrator to research details about a particular uh, OID. So you can actually go to the Cisco website and you can go to Cisco SNMP navigator and you can check out this, uh, you know, uh, this SNMP information on that, uh, you know, website so that you can figure out that information uh, for like a human, re in a re human readable format. Like for example, these guys have used this SNMP ID and they are looking for what it means and it's going to get uh, that information display on that uh, SNMP object navigator. On Windows servers, as I mentioned before, the SNMP, uh, you know, module, uh, or the object that you're going to install on the Windows Server will have the similar capabilities uh, as well. And there are also some third-party companies that provide uh, the, this kind of type of software as well. So I just want to show you what an MIB uh, Cisco website looks like. So if you have a Cisco account, in my case I do, uh, you can log into the this Cisco uh, portion of the website, which is SNMB Object Navigator, and you have two options: this one and this one. So the Cisco Navigator, the new uh, Cisco Feature Navigator, uh, that's this one. And then you also have the uh, SNMP Object Navigator right here, where you can enter image name or uh, like, for example, this one. For uh, they give you this image, so you can copy and then you can paste that. I'm just for an example, and when you search it, it'll give you that information listed on this site. And then it you can also do the translation of different NIBs. So you can find that information right here. Uh, so if you are a student, and if you do not have a Cisco account, it is free to register. So I'm already registered, so I have an account, but if you don't have an account, I would recommend that you go ahead and create this account so that you have the access to these uh, resources so that you can play with it and you can learn about uh, you know different things like for example it might be locator for example well, you know you can launch that and you can find you know you can take full advantage of these resources again i will go through them uh, later sometime uh, so that you can uh, you know you can um, learn about this smb uh, SNMP uh, object navigations. So there's a lab called Research Network Monitoring Software. And if you have access to this lab, go ahead and do it. But however, I, I will also find a copy of that lab and post to my YouTube channel. Uh, this is not a packet tracer file as far as I know. It is just a research uh, file where you go out into the internet and search some, uh, you know, network monitoring software. Again, I will introduce you to SNMP uh, and SNMP software on Windows servers on my server uh, lectures that I will be posting later sometimes as well. Syslog. Introduction to Syslog. Syslog, also known as system logs, uses UDP port 514 to send event notification messages across IP networks to event message collectors, as shown on the figure on the bottom uh, of your screen. So the, prior, the the purpose, the mechanism why we use this uh, Syslog mechanism is to collect event messages uh, to a Syslog server. The syslogging services provides three primary functions. 
They include the ability to gather logging information for monitoring and troubleshooting, the ability to select the type of logging information that is captured, the ability to specify the destinations of captured syslog messages. So what the syslog going to allow us to do is to have multiple uh, networking devices send information, system messages, that's where the syslog come from, system logs, messages to a syslog server, a centralized syslog server or mul even multiple syslog servers. So we can capture that logging messages to gather uh, information for monitoring, troubleshooting, uh, as well as uh, you know uh, making sure that the system is running smoothly. So that is the purpose of syslog. And you should know that the syslog use UDP port 514 to send those uh, event notification messages across an IP network to that event collectors. So how does the syslog operate? The syslog protocol starts by sending system messages and debug output to a local logging process. Syslog configuration may send these messages across the network to an external syslog server where they can be retrieved without needing the access to the actual device. Also, the syslog messages can may be sent to an internal buffer. And messages sent to the internal buffer are only viewable through the CLI of the device. So the ter terminal of the device needed to be uh, used in that case to view those messages. So for example, the Cisco uh, iOS devices such as routers and switches have built in internal buffers that will collect those syslog messages. And as a network administrator, you can view those syslog messages on your uh, Cisco CLI uh, on Cisco routers and switches. The network administrator may specify that only certain types of system messages be sent to various destinations. Popular destinations for syslog messages includes the logging buffer, which is the RAM inside a router or a switch, as I mentioned with Cisco devices, console line, terminal line, or syslog server. So let's look at the syslog message format. Cisco devices produce syslog messages as a result of network events. Every syslog message contains a severity level and a facility. The smaller numerical value levels are the more critical syslog alarms. For your exams and for your quizzes and to understand how syslog system works for your network administration career, you should know this by hand, like by heart. Like the smaller numerical levels on the syslog uh, message are the more critical the syslog alarm going to be. The severity level of the messages can be set to control where each type of message is displayed. For example, on the console or on the destination. The complete list of syslog levels are shown on the right hand side of your uh, screen right now. So the lower the value, the severity level, the lower that value uh, is more uh, you know critical that message is. For example, if it is an emergency, the level zero. If it's a alert, it's level one. But if it is just debugging, it's going to be level seven. So right here, it says gives you an explanation of those different levels. So emergency is system unstable, alert is immediate action needed. So an action need to be taken by the system administrator or network administrator. Critical is a, it's a critical condition. There is an error that's going to be level three. If there's if it is just a warning message, that's going to be a level four message. A notification going to be a level five message that is normal uh, operation, but significant condition. It says normal operation, maybe a bandwidth congestion, for example, but it is a significant condition that you should know about. Uh, level six is a D, uh, sorry the, uh, the informational messages and level seven is a debugging messages. So here is a, a situation that you should think about. So if you're doing a Cisco lab and you're getting a lot of debugging messages and informational messages that may cause your um, router, a Cisco router or switch to display a lot of information on its CLI 
and causing you to have a you know really hard time working with that device so that's where you should think about disabling uh, the these type of messages the the notification information and debugging messages from being displayed on your cisco cli because you can't work with the device you know you're trying to configure a dscp pool and you are getting these debugging messages uh, over and over and it's going to be really hard for you to work so in almost all cases i typically turn off debugging messages except when i'm building a huge uh, network you know and uh, you with uh, different uh, network ar architectures in advanced courses you may need to have those debugging uh, turn on uh, but one of the th things that i can give you a heads up warning is that you know make sure if you are getting way too many messages on your cli you may want to turn them off for the time being for the configuration configuration phase and then you can turn back on once the configura configuration is done so these messages that get displayed on your cli on especially cisco devices may have a negative impact on how uh, you know you can configure that device because if messages are keep popping back onto your screen you know you maybe have a hard time entering your commands into the device so you should think about disabling it if that's the situation syslog uh, facilities in addition to specifying the severity syslog messages can contain information on the facility Syslog facilities are service identifiers that identify and categorize system state data for error and even message reporting. The logging facility options that are available are specific to the networking device. So some common Syslog message facilities reported on Cisco IOS routers include the IP, OSPF protocol, uh, SYS uh, or since uh, operating system, uh, IP security or IPsec, interface uh, IP or IF um, data. So those are some common um, syslog messages facilities, uh, you know, available on Cisco IOS, but it may differ from, uh, you know, uh, depending on the specific networking device uh, and the vendor that you are using. Uh, remember I mentioned to you on previous slide um, the syslog messages displaying too many messages being displayed on the CLI one situation would be OSPF protocol so when you are configuring OSPF protocol uh, during the configuration you may want to turn off syslog because it's going to generate a lot of syslog messages uh, during the configuration phase so I've seen that uh, in my experience by default, the format of syslog messages on Cisco IOS software is the, the facility severity uh, you know, information and the description. It's like for example, the sample uh, output on the Cisco switch or for an ether uh, link changing its state to up shows that the link, the ether ch channel uh, link is showing as link three up down status. That's that's the that's the you know syslog message state uh, you know that about to gonna get displayed, and then uh, the message is uh, interface port channel eleven, sorry port channel one, uh, change state to up. So this syslog message on the CLI is saying, hey, the interface port channel one of that ether channel uh, that particular ether channel is have changed the state to up. Here, the facility link is the link. The, sorry, here the facility is link, and the severity level is three. With the uh, um, the the message information uh, of up down. So right here it says that information is a link level three. Severity level is three, and it shows uh, the associated information right here. So remember severity level. Few uh, slides back, right here. So that message is an error message or an error condition. So it's a level, it's a severity level of three. And we know that because right here, we have right here, it's right here. It says severity level three. So that's how, so that's how a typical Cisco IOS software would display the syslog information on a Cisco device. Configure syslog timestamp. By default, syslog messages are not timestamped. Log messages should be timestamped so that when they are sent to another destination, such as a syslog server, there is a record of when the message was generated. 
use the command service timestamps log date time. So this is the command service timestamps log date time to force log events to display the date and time. So remember on Cisco devices by default right out of the box, the log messages are not timestamp and you have to run the service timestamps log date time to force the log events to display that date and time. So on the bottom of your screen, uh, they are showing in this Cisco router one, they have gone into the configure terminal uh, options and on the interface G00, we have shut it down. And we see these, uh, the Cisco uh, log messages but it doesn't have the timestamp. It shows the order of operations when it had, like the, when, the, when the order which had it had happened, but it doesn't show the exact time. But however, if you uh, run the command service timestamps log date time, and that will force the now that the timestamp to be associated with uh, these syslog messages right here, the interface G00, and then you can run the no shutdown command and that gonna have those times have associated with that now. So now when the, the syslogs messages are generated, it will have an associated timestamp on the left hand side. And as a result, uh, as a system administrator or network administrator, you can have those information, the time information associated with the syslog and the changing state. So if I were you, uh, if I'm running a company a network system, I would always make sure that the service timestamp log is enabled. Uh, and uh, so that the if you are using a syslog server, that server will have all that data needed to make sure that you have a complete picture of the situation. So not just the message and the order which it comes, but also the exact time that happened. If you have set up your NTP server and your network times are already synchronized, everything should be good to go. Router and switch file maintenance. Router file systems. The Cisco IOS file system, also known as IFS, allows administrator to navigate to different directories and list the files in a directory. The administrator can create subdirectories in flash memory or on a disk. The directories available depend on the device. In this example on the right hand side, it displays the output of show file systems command. So the command is show file systems. It's a one single line command and which lists all of the available file systems on a Cisco 4221 router. So we have a Cisco 4221 router and we have issued the command shows file systems and it shows all the files available in that um, device. The asterisk indicates the, de the current default file system. So if you look at the list and right here, there's an asterisk and that would be the boot flash current default file system. The pound sign, which is you seen in, um, uh, let's see where it is. Uh, it's not showing up here. I, I don't believe it's in here. So the, the pound sign indicate a bootable disk, uh, both of these are assigned to flash file system by default. So right here we have the asterisk, which is a representation of the default file system. And uh, I don't know, I don't see the pound sign in here, but if you have the pound sign, that would indicate the bootable disk. So, I mean, the, the this router has all of these files, and what's really important is that this would be the current default file system. So that's what is shown here. Because the flash is the default file system, the dir command lists the contents of the flash. Because remember the flash, boot flash is the default file system. Because right here, that is the default file system. So because of that, what's gonna happen is the dir command now gonna list the contents of that flash. 
of specific interest is the last listing in here on the right hand side and this is the same of the current Cisco iOS file image that is running in the RAM. So if you look at the last entry in here and you can see that is the file that is currently being run which is this one right here dot bin dot bin file that file this is the name of the current Cisco iOS file image that is in the RAM running. So remember that. So what you can do is show file systems, then that will going to show you all the file systems that are available on your device. And now we know this is the boot flash right here, the one with the star on it, because that is indicates the current default file system. And on here, what we're going to do, we're going to go into that directory. So the directory of uh, the boot flash, because when you enter dir, that command will automatically get you the all the files within that directory because that is the default. So you don't even need to say uh, uh, boot uh, file, uh, you know, directory. You just enter dir. Why? Because the the flash default file system is that boot flash. So the dir will command will automatically list the items uh, listed under that default uh, file system. To view the content of NVRAM, you must change the current default file system by using the CD or the change directory command as shown in the example right here on the right hand side. So right here, CD NVRAM. So basically we are moving on to the NVRAM folder. So the present working directory command, which is PWD, uh, you know, is the, you know, the PWD command right here can be issued so that you can actually display the information in that directory. So this command verifies that we are viewing the NVRAM directory. How would we know that? Because PWD will return that the directory we are in is right now NVRAM right here. So finally, the dir command lists the contents of the nvram. So now we are in that nvram folder. You can run the dir command and that will list all the items within that folder. So although there are several configuration files listed of specific interest is the startup configuration file. So if you look at on the right hand side, you have right here, it says startup-config. That is the file of interest uh, for us. Please notice that these commands such as cd, PD, pwd, dir, these commands are very um, familiar when you are using uh, you know, Cisco devices as well as when you're using Linux devices. So if you have any experience in Linux server management or Linux operating systems such as Ubuntu, Red Hat, uh, CentOS, etc., you probably already have some uh, you know, familiarity with these commands that we are using. This is because Cisco, Cisco IOS is based on the Linux uh, framework, uh, Linux uh, Unix framework, and that is why uh, you know these commands uh, can be used in Cisco devices as well. So let's look at how we can switch file systems. So with the Cisco 2960 switch flash file system, you can copy configuration files and archive which is upload or and download software images. So with some of the Cisco switches, such as the Cisco 2960, you have the ability to copy, upload and download, in other words, you know, archive, copy or archive software images uh, using uh, the Cisco CLI. So the command to view the file system on a catalyst switch is the same as on a Cisco router, which is basically show file system. So the command will be show file systems. So right here on the right hand side, we have issued the show file systems and it would list the uh, all the, um, you know, uh, the files uh, in this uh, catalyst switch right here. Use a text file to backup a configuration. Configuration files can be saved to a text file by using a Terra term. So there's a way that you can backup your configuration files of your Cisco switches and routers uh, onto a, uh, you know, a text file because that way you can save them in a case of a 
corruption or you need to run the same configuration on multiple devices. So that's another reason why you may want to save the configuration as a text file. To do that, the first thing we're gonna do is to open the file menu and click the log. So on the uh, Terra term um, software, we're gonna go to file and go log. And by the way, the Terra term software is a free software you can download from the internet. And and the next thing we're gonna do is to choose the location to save the file. So the Terratime will begin capturing uh, text um, once the, the, you know, the location has been set. And the next step what we're gonna do is after capture has been started, the execute the show run config or show startup config command at the privileged executive mode in the Cisco device. And text displayed in the terminal window will now be directed to that chosen file in the Terra term. So when the capture is complete, select closed in the uh, Terra term, lo uh, term log window. And finally, you will be able to view the file to verify that it was not corrupted and properly saved and you can then you can use that file um, as a backup uh, of the uh, configuration for that uh, Cisco device. A configuration can be copied from a file and then directly posted to a device. So as I mentioned in previously, you can actually use those text file to actually install the same configuration on multiple Cisco devices. So you can uh, configure one Cisco switch and if you want the exact same configuration on a couple of other switches, you can basically copy and paste it. The file will be will require editing to ensure that encrypted passwords are in plain text in that situation and that non-command text such as more, like you know when there is more uh, information need to be displayed and the iOS messages are removed. So what you need to make sure in that uh, in the, there is that if you have a text file, with all the Cisco command and you have uh, any um, uh, you know encrypted passwords or you have some messages such as this more you know the text uh, uh, messages for users those need to be removed uh, from your plain text uh, uh, .txt file before you are copying that data to a new Cisco device. In addition, you may want to add enable and configure terminal to the beginning of the file or enter global configuration mode before pasting the configuration. So if you are copy and pasting, you need to make sure that you have the right privileges in the Cisco device by making sure that you are in the configuration terminal mode or you have to add the enable and configure terminal commands at the very top of that command list of text um, um, before you pasting into it. So instead of copying and pasting, configuration can be also restored from a text file by using Terra term. When using Terra term, you need to follow uh, the steps listed here. So what you need to do is you need to go on to the file menu, click send file. So on here, there is a file menu and there's an option called um, send file in here, right here, this one, the send file. And then the next thing is locate the file to be copied onto the device and click open. And then the Terra term will, will paste the file onto the device. So the text in the file will be applied as commands in the CLI and become the running configuration on that device as a result. Again, it may be a little bit confusing just reading through these slides. So I'm gonna actually show you how I use Terratum and how I'm gonna copy and paste uh, items onto uh, different uh, devices on Cisco once the configuration on has been set on one device. So I, I will show you how I can copy from one device to multiple devices on a later video. But for now, just remember it is possible to save your Cisco device configuration options and the configuration commands onto a .txt or plain text file. And then you can use that file as a backup and use it to restore or use that file to copy and paste those commands to multiple devices uh, that's supposed to have the same configuration within your network. This is a very useful tool and it saves a lot of time. And if you have done labs in the past, you probably already have done it, especially with ACLs, access control list. It is recommended that you actually use the .txt or text files to 
create those access control lists first on the outside the device and then paste it in, in, into the device uh, just to make sure that you don't have any mistakes, right? So you probably already familiar with the plain text files, but this is just giving you that information again. Using TFTP to backup and restore a configuration. So you can use TFTP servers or TFTP um, methodologies, the protocols to backup and restore uh, Cisco uh, device configurations. To do that, you need to follow the steps, uh, these steps listed here. Uh, the first step is to enter the copy running dash config TFTP command. So you need to run the copy running dash config TFTP command. And when you enter that command, that command will have multiple options that you need to configure. And those include the IP address of the host where the configuration file will be stored. So um, bef before you do any of these things, the first thing what I would do, I would go to the device such as the Cisco router, even though it is not listed here. And I would ping the uh, TFTP uh, server. So I would ping the 192.168.10.254 because that will make sure uh, that you have a proper connection to the your TFTP server before you trying to uh, you know send the files there. Because reason for that is otherwise you will you will try to figure out you know what's going on you know. So even before you do this, I I always ping the TFTP server first and then run the copy running dash config TFTP command because that way I'm 100% sure that this uh, TFTP server is accessible by the Cisco device such as this router, right? So in here, it, that uh, step is not included here, but that's what that's the first thing I would do. So once you know there is a connection to your TFT, uh, TFTP server, I would run the copy run running dash config TFTP command. And then you will enter that IP address where you have the connection uh, of that TFTP server, then enter the name to assign the configuration file. So that would be the name of the file that would be saved onto the TFTP server. So whatever the configuration that TFTP server gonna receive from this router will be saved under, in this case, R1-Jan-2019 and press enter to confirm the choice. So then when, once you confirm it and it will give you this uh, writing message so it will say writing that file name you entered here and it will give you this uh, um, this uh, symbol and this might go for a while if it is really slow uh, or it could be two seconds you know few seconds and it's done and it'll you will get a message saying okay that means it, it is um, done it's been backed up to tftp then you can use the following step to restore the running configuration from a TFTP uh, server. So to re restore from the server, TFTP server, what we do actually, we're going to again run uh, this time a different command, uh, but this time it's going to be copy TFTP running dash config. So the before it was copy running dash config TFTP, but in here copy TFTP running dash config. It is very important during lab exams, especially that you don't mix these two up because if you mix them up, you might be working on a lot of, um, uh, you know, configuration commands or during your exam where with limited time, mixing these two up will mess up your entire configuration, right? So be careful. So the copy running dash config TFTP will send the configuration from your Cisco device to the TFTP the copy TFTP running dash config will retrieve information from the TFTP server and install it onto your router. So if you enter this one, again, it's gonna give you the uh, the option of entering uh, the, what kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, IP address that it needs to look for. And then once you enter that IP address, you can enter the name assigned to that particular file that you have previously saved and you press enter, then it will start writing to your uh, router. So be careful with these two commands, especially during exams. You don't want to erase all your configuration by running this one uh, when you should be running this one uh, especially, okay? Be careful with that. USB ports on a Cisco router. The universal serial bus, which often commonly known as USB, USB is a storage feature enables uh, certain models of Cisco routers that support USB flash drives. 
So certain models of Cisco routers will have the USB storage feature enabled. So the USB flash feature provides an optional secondary storage capability and an additional boot device. The USB ports of a Cisco 4321 router are shown in this figure on the bottom of uh, your screen. Right here, you have this, these are both of them as USB ports right here. And you can use the DIR command to weave the contents of the USB flash drive when uh, if USB flash drive is connected to this USB port. Please keep in mind, not all Cisco routers will have the USB storage feature. It is only certain Cisco routers such as the Cisco 4321 router that would have this option. Using USB to backup and restore a configuration. So you can issue the show file systems. So the command is show file systems, command to verify that the USB drive is there and confirm its name. For this example, the USB file system is named USB flash zero. And you can see that because uh, when you enter the show, copy running dash config USB flash zero, it was able to write to that uh, USB um, you know, um, uh, device, right? But if you don't know what it is named, you can run the show file systems command to verify the USB drive is there. And also you can get the name of that device. So once you know the name of the device, as I mentioned, what you're going to do, you're going to run, uh, you're going to enter copy run USB, whatever the name, uh, copy run whatever the name of that thing, right? So in this case, copy running config USB uh, flash zero, and that command will copy the configuration file to the USB flash drive. And you just need to make sure to use the name of the flash drive as indicated in the file system. These a slash is uh, uh, an optional, but indicates that the root directory of the USB flash drive, the, 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 the slash, so it's optional. Uh, however, also this command in here on this Cisco uh, documentation is kind of incorrect because it should say copy dash as uh, copy running dash config. This should say copy run dash config or copy run dash config uh, USB flash. So this is not copy run, <laughs> this, it should be, th this is the correct command. So just do that one. So that's how you copy to a USB drive. The iOS will prompt for the file name, just like previously when we were trying to do it on TFTP server. And if the file already exists on the USB drive, the router will prompt uh, to override it. So in this case, you're gonna ask like, hey, what's the file name you want to use? We're gonna get the R1 config and say, hey, that's a warning message, right? So it's gonna give a warning message on CLI saying there is a file already exists with the same name. Do you want to override it? And if you press enter, it's gonna confirm it. And as a result, it's gonna override that file. So this is how you can back up your Cisco configurations on a router or a switch, especially on routers onto a USB drive. If, if your Cisco router uh, or switch even supports the USB storage uh, feature. So you had to have that port and you had to have these specific types of uh, routers, for example, Cisco 4321, in order for, for you to do this. Otherwise you won't be uh, have that option to do, right? Because there won't be any USB. Keep that in mind. Uh, so the DIR command, uh, again, can be used to see the files on the USB drive and uh, you can use the more command to see the content. So on the right hand side, uh, while the USB drive is still connected, uh, plugged into the, uh, the Cisco router, you can run the DIR command with that the USB flash drive name. In this case, it's a USB flash zero. And with that, what you can do actually, you can view the contents in that file. To restore configurations with a USB flash drive, it will be necessary to edit the USB R1 config file with a text editor. So this is something that may trip you up, especially if you are working in the field. So if you want to restore a configuration that now has been saved onto a USB drive, it may be, you know, it will, it, it, I mean, it will be necessary to edit that USB, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the text file contained within that uh, USB flash drive. You can just restore it like we do it with the TFTP server. Assuming the file name is r1-config, use the command copy USB flash uh, zero this command uh, to restore a running config. But be careful, you may you will need to edit 
um, you know, uh, some of those files before you try to restore it. Password recovery procedures. Passwords on devices are used to prevent unauthorized access. For encrypted password, such as the enable secret passwords, the passwords must be replaced after the recovery. So depending on the device, the detailed procedure for password recovery varies because it depending on the iOS version and the device in use. Um, but for certainly the encrypted password, you need to make sure that you replace those passwords once the recovery is done. However, all password recovery procedures follow the same principles. The principle is to first enter the uh, Roman mode and then um, uh, you're going to do the change the configuration register, register, uh, copy the startup config to running config, change the password, save the running config as the new startup config and reload the device. So those are the steps that you have to take in order for you to, uh, you know, recover the password. For next few slides, I will go over these steps with some uh, example images. So the first step uh, in this password recovery example is to enter the Roman mode or R-O-M-M-O-N, Roman, Roman mode, right? So with the console access, a user can access the Roman mode by using a break sequence during the boot up process of removing the external flash memory when the device is powered off. So you have two options. The one is um, by, you know, and having the break sequence during a boot up process. The other option is to remove the external flash memory when the device is powered off. The easiest way is to actually to break it, break the, you know, break the boot up process. So when successful, you will have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, showing up on the uh, left hand side of your CLI. So the, the prompt will display Roman one and then we'll have this, uh, you know, uh, arrow right here. So that's how you know that you are in that mode. So that's the first step you need to do. The second step is to change the configuration, reg, configuration register. So to change the configuration register, uh, what we're gonna do, uh, the config, uh, sorry, uh, confreg, C-O-N-F-R-E-G, confreg. So we're gonna use the confreg 0x2142, so 0x2142 command um is the one that we're going to use that will allow us the uh, to set the configuration register to 0x2142 which causes the device to ignore the startup config file during startup so that to change the configuration regist register we're going to enter the command confreg 0x2142 and that what's going to do is the device will ignore the startup config file during, uh, you know, the, uh, the during the startup. So that is that is a key piece of information, right? So after setting the configuration register to zero x two one four two, you need to type reset because that's going to reset the device, right? The reset uh, at the prompt to the restart the device. So that will going to reset the device. This command going to reboot the device, and enter the break sequence while the device is rebooting and decompressing the iOS. The example displays the terminal output of a 1941 router in the Roman mode after using the break sequence during the boot up process. So after the, the you know, um, the, you, you are in the Roman mode, you're gonna enter confreg 0x2142 reset and the system uh, boots up uh, and that's what, you know, get reset. And that's what you need to do in the step number two. In step three, we're gonna copy the startup config to the running config. So after the device has finished reloading, issue the copy startup config running config command. But however, caution here, do not enter copy running config startup config. So you need to make sure you run copy startup config running config, not running config startup config, because if you mix these two up, it is bad. This command erases your original startup configuration. You, what you need to run is copy startup config running config. 
you are copying the startup configuration to the running configuration. We are not copying the running configuration to the startup configuration that would erase everything. So be cautious about what you're entering. So in here you need to enter copy startup config space running config, which would actually what's gonna do is gonna copy uh, the startup configuration into the running configuration of your router. In step four, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the password. So because you are in privileged executive mode, you can now configure all the necessary passwords. So the uh, password Cisco is not a strong password. And in this example, we are using that uh, just to show you, you know, you can enter the enable secret and you can enter whatever the password you like. In this example, we are using the Cisco one. Step five, you need to save the running config as the new startup config. So after the new passwords are configured, change the configuration register back to 0x2102 by using the config-register this time, config-register 0x2102. So you need to enter that command in the global configuration mode and save the running config to the startup config. So on right here, we can have the config-register 0x2102 Two one or two, and we're gonna exit out of that. Then we're gonna issue the command copy running config into the startup config. And once it is done, you have successfully recovered your Cisco router, uh, you know, with respect to your password. So you have recovered your passwords. I just want to point say something that is not on this slide, uh, but uh, that is uh, important for students who are using Cisco Packet Tracer uh, because. Um, also, uh, any simulation program or emulation program such as ENG, uh, you don't have to do all of these steps if you forget your password, for example, encrypted password. There are websites on the internet that can take the Cisco encrypted password, you can copy it from your emulation and they can decrypt it for you. So, you know, if you are running a lab and you forgot the password, have that uh, uh, Cisco password decryptor website open. Uh, there are multiple websites, many people have it because it's used the same algorithm. It can do a reverse uh, algorithm pretty much on it and it can get you the password. You don't have to go through all of these five steps uh, during an exam or a quiz, especially with the limited time. You really don't have time to do all of these five steps. You forgot the password or you accidentally enter something incorrectly. You can simply use one of those uh, uh, websites where you can, uh, you know, uh, reverse engineer the password without going through all of these five steps. But this is still, this is still uh, a, uh, a, a the, what is recommended by Cisco for password recovery. These are the, these five steps. Even though you can decrypt the password using certain programs. So there's a file, uh, a packet tracer file called backup configuration files. If you have access to this file, please go ahead and do this. But if you do not, I will leave a copy on my website once I find it so that you can go ahead and do it. Again, I will do live demonstrations about these uh, uh, labs and packet tracer files on my uh, YouTube channel later sometime. And there's also a lab called use TerraTerm to manage uh, router configuration files. Again, if you have access to this uh, TerraTerm lab, please go ahead and do it. But if you do not have access to this file, um, I will try to find a copy and I will do the lab in a live uh, demonstration as well. There is another lab called use TFTP, flash and USB to manage configuration files. Again, if you do not have access to this file, I will try to find a copy and uh, post it to my uh, website as well as do them live. Uh, there's another lab associated with this called Research Password Recovery Procedures. Um, this is a, a lab documentation you can follow to do some research on uh, other password recovery procedures, including maybe the one that I mentioned on the using a reverse engineering. Uh, but like you know using copying the uh, encrypted password and using reverse engineering to figure it out so again if i find these documents i'll post it so you can do them but for now we're just gonna uh, skip through some of these slides ios image management there's a video called managing cisco ios images if you do not have access to cisco netacad 
Again, I have a copy on my YouTube channel, so I will leave a link in the description of this video. If it is possible, I will also post it on the top right hand corner as a card. Uh, sometimes uh, YouTube won't allow me to add too many cards to it, but if I can, I will put it on the top right hand corner as well. So please check the video description for this um, uh, video and you should watch this managing Cisco iOS images video before you proceed with the next few slides. TFTP servers as a backup location. As a network grows, Cisco iOS software images and configuration files can be stored on a central TFTP server. This helps to control the number of iOS images and the versions to those iOS images as well as the configuration files that must be maintained. So if you have a large network especially and you have multiple Cisco switches and routers, uh, you can use those TFTP uh, centralized servers to manage the iOS images and revisions or version numbers uh, associated with those iOS images. Production internetworks usually span wide areas and contain multiple routers. For any network, it is good practice to keep a backup copy of the Cisco iOS software image in case the system image on the router becomes corrupted or accidentally erased. So it is always good practice to have a, a image backup of the Cisco iOS software. Widely distributed routers need a source or backup location for Cisco iOS software images. Using a network TFTP server allows image and configuration uploads and downloads over the network. The network TFTP server can be another router, a workstation or a host system. So you can actually use a, another Cisco router as a TFTP server or it could be a workstation or a host system. So it could be a uh, even Windows, even Windows Server can get TF, some of those TFTP, the, actually all, all of those TFTP files uh, save onto it as well. So you can use a separate dedicated server, a workstation or a Cisco router, another router itself can be used as a backup as well. Backup iOS image to TFTP server example. To maintain network operations with minimum downtime, it is necessary to have procedures in place for backing up Cisco iOS images. This allows the network administrator to quickly copy an image back to a router in case of a corrupted or erased image. To do that, you need to follow the following steps. So step one, ping the TFTP server. Remember I mentioned about pinging TFTP server earlier on that Cisco forgot to mention on the slide. So they are telling you to do that right here. The step, very first step is to ping the TFTP server. The ping the TFTP server to test the connectivity. So basically we are testing the connectivity. So we know that there is no connectivity issue with the TFTP server. So we, we verify that. So the step two is to verify the image size in flash. Verify that the TFTP server has sufficient disk space to accommodate the Cisco iOS software image. To do that, use the show flash zero command uh, on the router to determine the size of the Cisco iOS image. So first we need to figure out how big the Cisco iOS image on the router itself. Uh, then we can check against the uh, TFTP server's uh, availability of the hard hardware space, right? Step three, copy the t t image to the TFTP server. So that's the pretty much the final step. To do that, what we're gonna do, we're gonna copy the image to the TFTP server by using the copy, then the source URL or de uh, destination URL command, and, and you know, source URL destination URL command. And then after issuing the command by using the specified source and destination URLs, the user is prompted for the source file name. IP address of the remote host and the destination file name. The transfer will begin once you have all that data. Copy an iOS image to a device example. So to copy an iOS image to a device, the first step we need to do again is to ping the TFTP server. Again, we're gonna test the connectivity to TFTP server by pinging that from your router. 
second step, we're gonna verify the amount of free flash again. So to ensure that the sufficient flash space on the device being upgraded, in this case, your Cisco router, what are you gonna do? We're gonna use the show flash command. So the command what we're gonna use is show flash command. And then we're gonna compare the free flash space with the new image uh, 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 file size. So we're gonna compare those and we're gonna see if it is enough space for us to install this new uh, configuration, new uh, iOS image, right? Not the configuration, the iOS image. So the third step is to copy the iOS file from the TFTP server to the router by using the copy TFTP colon and then the flash colon command. And after issuing the, this command, the user will be prompted for the IP address of the remote host, source file name and the destination file name, just like we had previously on uh, the other uh, you know, configuration backup and configuration restore options. So just like the configuration backing up and restore to a TFTP server, when we are copying and backing up uh, the Cisco IOS images, we follow the similar steps uh, as shown here on the bottom of your screen. So copy TFTP flash, that will give you that. And then you have the file name and you see this thing showing that it is trying to copy. And once it's done, it'll give you a message, it's completed, right? So that's how you uh, copy an iOS image to a device. The boot system command. During startup, the bootstrap code passes the startup configuration file in nvram for the boot system commands that specify the name and location of the Cisco iOS software image to the load. So remember that during the startup, the bootstrap code passes this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the startup configuration file in nvram for the boot system commands. That's what it's going to use in order for it to locate the name. Uh, and locate the file for the Cisco IOS software image to be loaded onto that um, Cisco device. Several boot system commands can be entered in sequence to provide a fault tolerant boot plan. If there are no boot system commands in the configuration, the router defaults to loading the first valid Cisco IOS image in the flash memory and it runs it. So if there are no boot system commands available, the router gonna find the first valid Cisco iOS image in its flash memory and it's just gonna run that. To upgrade to the copied iOS image after that image is saved on the flash memory of the router, configure the router to load the new image by using the boot system command. So you need to issue the boot system command in your configurations. Then you need to save the configuration, reload the router to boot the router with the new image. So right here on the bottom of your screen, uh, we go into the uh, configuration terminal mode and we are issuing the boot system command. And the option associated with that command is the, the file name the, the, in the flash zero. So the flash, that flash zero have this file name. That's the new Cisco IOS. So we're gonna issue boot system uh, that information and then you're gonna exit out of it. Then what we're gonna do, we're gonna say copy running config startup config. And then we're gonna issue the reload command once the data has been copied uh, to the device. So you're gonna reboot it and that will reload this file, this iOS image as the uh, the default image uh, for the uh, boot system, right? The, for the boot. So that's where it's gonna get that information from that you need to set this thing up because otherwise what's going to happen is it's just going to load the first valid Cisco iOS image in the flash memory and it's just going to run that. There's another packet tracer file called use a TFTP server to upgrade a Cisco iOS image. If you have access to this file, please go ahead and do it. If you do not, I will try to find a copy of this file and post to my sanuja.com website so you can go ahead and download and do them. Again, I will do this demonstration on separate videos and post it later sometime. That would bring us to the end of this lecture. In on next few slides, I will cover what we have gone over in this module. Again, there is a packet tracer file called configure CDP, LLDP, and NTP. 
as well as a lab file called configure CDP, LLDP, and NTP. If you have access to those two files, please go ahead and do it. If you do not, again, I will make sure to post them onto my sanuju.com website because these files will summarize everything and most of the items that we have covered in this module. So in this module, we learn Cisco Discovery Protocol, also known as CDP, is a Cisco proprietary layer two protocol that is used to gather information about Cisco devices which shares the same data link. CDP can be used as a network discovery tool to determine the information about the neighboring devices. The information gathered from CDP can help build a logical topology of a network when documentation is missing or lacking in detail. On Cisco devices, CDP is enabled by default. To enable CDP globally for all the supported interfaces on the device, you can enter the CDP run in the global configuration mode. To enable CDP on the specific interface, enter the CDP enable command within that interface and that would work as well. To verify the status of the CDP and display a list of neighbors, use the show CDP neighbors command in the privilege executive mode. Cisco devices also support link layer discovery protocol, also known as LLDP, which is a vendor neutral neighbor discovery protocol which is similar to CDP. So the LLDP is vendor neutral, while the CDP is vendor specific to Cisco. So just remember both of them are doing the similar uh, thing, similar act, uh, you know, activity, but LLDP is uh, vendor neutral, while CDP is Cisco specific. To enable LLDP globally on a Cisco network device, we enter the LLDP run command in the global configuration mode. With LLDP enabled, device neighbors can be discovered by using the show LLDP command, uh, sorry, show LLDP neighbors command. Uh, when more details about the neighbors are needed, we can use the show LLDP neighbors detail command uh, that can provide information such as the neighbors iOS version, IP address, and the device capability. When the time is not synchronized, between devices, we learn it will be impossible to determine the order of events uh, and cause of the uh, an event on your network. So you can manually configure the date and time, or you have the option of configuring the NTP, which allow devices on the network to synchronize their time settings with an NTP server. NTP networks use a hierarchical system of time sources and each level in the system is called a stratum and we learn that the authoritative time sources also refers to as stratum zero devices are high precision timekeeping devices while the stratum one devices are directly connected to those authoritative time sources stratum two devices such as ntp clients synchronize their time by using the ntp packets from that stratum one servers we also learned the NTP server IP address command is used in global configuration mode to configure a device as the NTP server. So if you have a Cisco device, if you want to configure it as the NTP server, you can run the NTP server IP address command. To verify the time source is set to NTP, we can use the show clock detail command. The show NTP associations and show NTP status commands are used to verify that the device is synchronized with the NTP server. SNMP is an application layer protocol that provides a message format for communication between ma ma managers and agents. Remember, we learned about SNMP which is a type of application layer protocol that provides you know, the information about communication between managers and the agents, right? So the SNMP system consists of three elements, SNMP manager, SNMP agents, and the MIB or MIB. The SNMP manager can collect information uh, from an SNMP agent by using the get action and can change the configuration on an agent by using the set action. SNMP agents 
can forward information directly to a network manager uh, by using what we call traps. Those are SNMP traps. We also learn about the SNMP version 1, SNMP version 2C, SNMP version 3 are all versions of SNMP. While SNMP 1 is a legacy solution, both SNMP 1 and SNMP uh, 2C use uh, a common uh, community-based form of security. We also learn the SNMP version 3 provides for both security models and, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, security models and security levels with SNMP3. So if you have the option of implementing SNMP on a new network in 2022, you should always try to use the SNMP version 3 unless there is some extreme case that there is no way to implement that. The MIB organizes variables hierarchically and OIDs uniquely identify and manage objects in the MIB hierarchy. The Cisco SNMP Navigator on the Cisco website you can find uh, allows a network administrator to research details about a particular OID. Remember, I have shown uh, what Cisco Navigator look like. Uh, you can create an account on Cisco website to access that uh, system. The Syslog protocol uses UDP port 514 to allow networking devices to send their system messages across the network to Syslog servers. We also learn the Syslog logging services service provides three primary functions. They include gather logging information for monitoring and troubleshooting, select the type of logging information that is captured and specify the destinations of captured Syslog messages. We also learned that the destinations for syslog messages includes the logging buffer. Uh, those are the RAM inside a router or a switch, console line, terminal line, uh, and syslog server. So you could have syslog information stored within the device itself using the RAM. Syslog facilitates, uh, uh, sorry, syslog facilities identify and categorize system state data for error and even message reporting. Common syslog message facilities reported on Cisco iOS routers includes the IP OSPF protocol, SYS operating system, IPsec, and IF. The default format of syslog messages on Cisco iOS software going to be this particular uh, method. So the use the command service timestamps log date time to enforce logged event to display the date and time. Why? With the default format on Cisco iOS software doesn't have the time in that configuration, right? So what we need to do is we need to issue the, um, the command service timestamp log, date time to force those, uh, you know, um, log messages to include the time which that uh, event happens. We also learned the Cisco IFS lets the administrator navigate to different directories and list the files in a directory and to create subdirectories in flash memory or on a desk. Use the show file system command to weave the file systems on a catalyst switch or Cisco router. We also learned configuration files can be saved to a text file by using TerraTerm. A configuration can be copied from a file and then directly pasted onto a device. And I also mentioned that if you have a configuration that needed to be applied to multiple switches exactly as it is, you can actually uh, copy from one uh, Cisco uh, switch to another by using those text file methods. Configuration files can be stored on a TFTP server or a USB drive. To save the running configuration or startup configuration to a TFTP server, use either the copy running config TFTP or copy startup config TFTP command. We also learn Cisco iOS software images and configuration files can be stored on a central TFTP server to control the number of iOS images and the revisions to those iOS images as well as the configuration files that must be maintained that will make sure that your organization have the consistency throughout all your Cisco devices. Select a Cisco iOS image file that meets the requirements in terms of platform, features, and software. 
download the file from cisco.com and transfer it to the TFTP server. To upgrade to the copied iOS image after that image is saved on the router's flash memory, configure the router to load the new image during boot up by using the boot system command. If you like these type of lectures, please make sure to thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the items we have covered today, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Please study carefully every item that we have covered before you take your quiz or exam. And until next time, good luck and have a nice day.